Good morning and welcome to Life for the Nations, Camarilla. We are one heart and one mind, so let's celebrate Jesus today. Welcome to Life for the Nations, Kim Rio. I'm Pastor Jen, and this is Pastor Nick, and we're so glad that you've come to join us this morning. You know, what we want to do is we want to create an altar for the Lord, and we want um, we want open heavens over your home, over this home. And, and so, as Pastor Ismail was teaching us on Thursday, we want to be in that right position so that we can receive um, his presence and so that we can be ready to, to talk about him wherever we go, to always be ready to snap to obedience because we want to please him. He is the one that we please. He is the one that we seek, and he is the one that is going to guide our entire lives. Well, we're really glad that you joined us here this morning. Welcome, welcome. Um, this is Life for the Nations Camarillo, and um, you were born for this time. You were born for this time. Uh, it's shocking, right? When I heard that phrase, I remember thinking, no, the people at the Revolutionary War, you know, they were amazing. They were heroes. They were strong. They went out and fought. They were willing to put their lives on the line, and they were willing to do anything to make our country free, and they were overwhelmed by, you know, so many British troops, and they really should not have won, uh, but how in the world did they do it? And then in World War II as well, you know, you see all these young GIs, and they all went off, and my grandparents went off, both of them, uh, and they worked hard hard to get that war won and they fought and they, I don't know, to me, they were amazing. They were the heroes. 
But for someone to say, oh, you were born for such a time as this, well, I don't know. I, you know, have you ever thought about that? Would you be willing to hide the Jewish people during World War II if you lived in Germany? Would you be willing to put your life on the line and, and send your own children to a concentration camp for disobeying the, the federal law of the, of the land? Well, I don't know. I always shivered when I thought of that. You know, oh, I don't want to be put in that position. You know, you watch the movies and you're like, oh, I'm so glad they're having to go through it, but not me. Wow. Um, it kind of feels like we kind of go, go through it anyway. Well, hang on. I'm coming okay. to that point. <laughs> uh -huh. He caught on. He okay, caught on right. quick. That's okay. But to have to face a painful death or run away, I mean, to be told you need to have everything loaded in your car and be ready to run, um, you know, to face prison time, um, or to even have things ready in your house in case there's a big emergency, you know. You, we're often told to have an emergency, be ready for an earthquake, but what if there's something even more sinister at plan, planned out? That, are you ready? Do you, are you, is your family ready? Do you know what you would do? Um, I often actually shivered about that when my kids were little because I was like, I don't know what we'd do if there was a big earthquake, you know, a big one like the Northridge earthquake. And, and, you know, the whole house is crumbling and falling down. And um, people have showed me pictures of their the houses in Fillmore and the whole house is just tilted over and you couldn't live in that house any longer. Where would we go? Where was the closest school that we were to go and evacuate to? Well, you know, am I at that level? Am I at that caliber? Am I that kind of person? Is that the generation we really have today? You know, those of us born in the in the late 60s, you know, we're called Gen X. Are we really at that caliber, that World War II people or that generation from the Revolutionary War? Um, you know, life can be difficult today. Like you mentioned, you know, in many, many ways we are overwhelmed. It's a dark world. I mean, it is so corrupt with so many morals and values that are so compromised. The biblical view is seen as evil and things that are criminal and dark. Those values are seen as good. Uh, and the media makes a big deal about criminalizing Christians, but not the ones that are actually out there, um, you know, threatening the police or destroying the police or, 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 you know, doing criminal activity like going in and just ripping everything to shreds inside of a, of, of, of a nice store and stealing everything. I mean, that, that you even can be prosecuted if you try to stop people. Who yeah, steal. and then and then if you try to stop those that are trying to steal because they're they're um, what's it, it they're called shoplifting, then then we're fired. Those people are fired. I mean, that caliber of just darkness. You know, you're like, wait. This is making what is evil into what is good, like at, at that level. Um, and then to add insult to injury, we are also as Christians told and, and forced to not just approve, but we are to embrace these dark deeds. We are to say, oh, yes, it's okay. $900 worth of merchandise. Go ahead and steal it out of every store. No problem. Go for it. You need it. You're entitled to it. So I'm like, uh, I don't know how to stop this. I don't. I feel very overwhelmed when I watch the news. I feel very overwhelmed when I see um, good families um, and their family members are thrown into prison for 16 years for doing nothing, <laughs> literally doing nothing. And then you've got people that have done incredibly criminal deeds, horrible things, you know, throwing police cars upside down and rioting and throwing rocks and destroying property, but they're nothing absolutely nothing they're fine they're entitled to go do that they're they're mostly peaceful when they burn down an entire police department that's mostly peaceful so am i really going to rise up and know what to do to stop all this criminal activity even so okay so here's the point of this whole thing god knew that yes you and me we were born for such a time as this <laughs> it's like what wait what what am i supposed to do God knew that you were to be born exactly at this time into this world. He knew what you would look like. He knew what your voice would be like. He knew what your values would be. He knew how your family would raise you. And he knew that you would be born for such a time as this. If you will allow him to use you to be a champion and to call out things as they need to be called out. Because he's calling you. 
and you're already a champion if you've chosen Jesus to be your Lord and if you said you're my captain I'm gonna follow you and the Bible's gonna be my constitution I'm gonna go against what is the pervasive in this world today well let's look at another champion I think I, I've kind of given it away a little bit but another champion for me that I was thinking about was another person who was born in into a pagan world a world that was full of evil full of corruption all anti-biblical values and morals they would go into their temples and 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 literally destroy their children and the women would go at, at, at the time of, of certain feasts and just prostitute themselves but Esther was born into this time Esther 414 says for if you remain silent at this time Jen if you remain silent at this time Pastor Nick if you remain silent at this time relief and deliverance for the people of the United States for the Jews in this case the Bible verse says the Jews will arise from another place but you and your family your father's family will perish you and I will perish our family our whole future generations will perish if we are not willing to rise up and be that champion God has called us to be it says who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this so yeah you and I are chosen you know Esther who was she she was a young girl part of the class of subservient conquered people I mean nobody looked twice at a Jewish girl in Babylon she was completely alone um, an orphan she all she had was the wisdom and training she had received growing up by her cousin Mordecai who was an older cousin he raised her and all of a sudden she's given great power all of a sudden but she's in this harem all by herself she has nobody any longer that are Jewish people nobody that community I bet she was part of a very tight community where they all went and worshiped together they all knew each other they all you know spent Sabbath together and here she's now ushered into this complete Babylonian environment where she's if by, by her looks because of her looks and she's like uh, I don't even know what to do here she's given great power and position because the king falls deeply in love with her and she's married and there's a whole bunch of maybe other wives that she has to contend with we don't hear about them but we know Vashti got thrown out that was the king's first wife she herself who was a Jew who was an orphan had no prestige and all of a sudden God opens a door for Esther to step in to great power she steps in and all of a sudden she's given great power who knows how old she was maybe 17 or 18 does your 17 or 18 year old know to step in to have great power you know but she was positioned perfectly to, for heaven to to work through her life the doors of heaven opened up and she was able to see a great victory for her people a great victory for her own life and Mordecai um, was who was her cousin uh, she, he was able to help her move remove a very wicked man from her husband's inner circle and so she was used and she was willing to be used as a vessel to use her power to bring about great righteousness great righteousness and justice happened in the land because she was willing well the events of Esther's life mirror your life yes believe it I know it's like uh, no I'm not a great and beautiful person I'm not 17 okay so hang with me you have been chosen to move into a situation in your own circumstances where you carry great power a position you are in a position of great power you have a voice you were created in his image you carry his spirit if you've given your life to Jesus so you are sanctified you are holy and the king chooses you to walk away from a life of enslavement and being an orphan into sin to be his chosen one to be his queen or his king and to reign by his side the king has chosen you and he deeply loves you and he treasures you and he says anything you want I will give to you if you will just open your life to me Esther was chosen to be by the queen by the king to be his queen and reign by his side and each one of us have been chosen by King Jesus to come by his side and reign with him 
First Peter 2 9 you are a chosen people my a royal priesthood a holy nation God's special possession that you may declare his pra the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light you know Esther was chosen by God to be um, first to be an instrument of salvation by her people the Jews and at this time Okay, the second person in command of the whole nation was a man named Haman. All of Babylon was under her husband Xerxes, then came, and she didn't really have much power. She was just the queen. But Haman had a great deal of power. He was like the prime minister. He could change laws. I mean, all he had to get was the seal of approval from the king. And he had a visceral hatred for the Jews. Does that sound like something today you watch the news and there is a visceral hatred against all christians and against the bible against the morals and values of the bible bible and we are called to worship satan we don't see it as that he's called an angel of light it's peace oh the name of peace um, it's called, oh, let's talk about how beautiful um, all these people are out there that have changed their whole lives, their, their, their sexuality. They are the ones that we're supposed to worship and embrace and, and love. And oh, the government. Yes, we need to worship the government. Haman also wanted everybody to worship him. He also wanted you to worship the government. As a matter of fact, he was so angry that Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. And he was, he represented the government. He's like, and he wanted, to be honest, I've heard someone say this, and I think it's true. He really actually wanted to, at some point, enact a coup and take over and kick out the king. And he, I, I don't know that he didn't, he wasn't the one that actually instigated the king getting rid of his first wife, Vashti, putting Esther into her position. He didn't realize that God was actually using his visceral hatred to put another Jew that would actually bring his downfall in. And so let's just keep, you know, stick with me here. But you as a woman or man of God, if you were a godly woman or man and you were filled with God's spirit, you too can help destroy the kingdom of darkness because Satan always wants to come in and kill and steal and destroy and make you worship somebody that he wants you to worship, which is himself. He wants to get rid of the king in heaven and he wants to take over command. And so that's why Haman said, everybody has to worship me. But one Jew stood and said, I'm not going to worship you. I'm not doing it. And that was Esther's cousin Mordecai. So now the entire population, Haman, with his visceral hatred, convinces the king to destroy these people. He convinces him. He somehow whispers into his ear, and he's like, those people. There's a great, and, the, and the king, blinded and deaf to anybody but Haman's voice, and who, who, who could be that? You know, some of our leaders, our judges, some of our district attorneys in, in different states, they are blinded to God's voice. And all they hear is the voice of Haman or the government or whoever it is that they're listening to to say, give him a death sentence, kill him off, throw him in jail, give him a sentence of 17 years in federal prison for doing absolutely nothing. And so Haman says, let's get your seal of approval to destroy these people it was on a certain day, and blindly the king trusts and seals their fate. So what's going to happen to Esther's people? Mordecai tells her, you have been raised up. You have been chosen for such a time as this. This is your moment. Here you go. Shine. You've been given great power and a great opportunity. Now, now she was given a great deal of power, but she wasn't necessarily a man. Back in those days, it was a man who needed to be the one pretty much in charge of everything. Uh, she was just a young girl, but she had the king's heart. You might just be someone who's completely, you're like, I have no power. I'm nothing. I don't even have a loud voice. I have problems speaking. I am uh, young, very, very young. What am I going to do? You have power. So in today's world, in the U.S., especially here in California, if you listen to the news, if you listen to influencers, the movies, TV shows, talk shows, commercials, there seems to only be one agenda. And we're all to agree with it. Otherwise, we are sentenced to death. We're canceled. We're dismissed. We're laughed at. We're labeled or we're shunned. Even our own family members will shun us for not embracing these three. These are three big ones, but I'm sure there's more. 
One agenda is that we are to fully accept that our children be indoctrinated into some sort of sexual ideology as young as preschool. And, and we're to trust in their version of what they call love. And that's LGBTQ. And, and they have one of them, which is I am, I am in love with minors. So in other words, pedophilia. This is what Babylon was all about as well. Okay, another agenda. We are to accept and take whatever medicine they're pushing at us. Big Pharma says you are to trust the science and humans are just hackable animals and we're all evolved from monkeys anyway. So there's no morals, there's no values, there's nothing. The Bible is just a load of fat fantasy. It's a fairy tale from ancient times and Jesus, he was a hackable animal too. That's the agenda that we are shoved and pushed to believe and to think. Another agenda is that this current administration is the best in the world. Oh, the economy is perfect. Our borders are perfectly safe, and we need to trust in the government. It doesn't matter that you have to pay $700 more a month to survive. In the end, we'll be happy to have nothing because that's the agenda, really. It's to remove all of your ability to make money and, and, and to own, they don't want you to own anything, anything. No houses, no cars, you just rent everything. Currently, if you buy a car and you want certain items in it, you have to now rent them from the company. You're not allowed to own it any longer, flat out. If you want to buy certain, it's better, What's what do they do right now? They're pushing leasing, Let, just lease the car. And then you buy another lease and you just never own that vehicle. Each of these ideologies and narratives are pushed in subtle and sometimes very blatant ways. They're very Haman-like because they want to kill off the spirit of God in this country. They're like, no, this country isn't one nation under God. I mean, what God? God, who, there's many gods. Your God, you know, sure. <clears throat> there is no spirit of God, no living God. Our nation was founded you know, on biblical principles, whether or not you want to believe that our founding fathers believed in Jesus, I don't care. If you look at the document, God's hand is all over the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, all of it. And our former and our fathers, the, the you know, George Washington, oh, he was just a deist. But the word of God was penetrating all of those documents and our nation was founded on Jesus Christ and the pilgrims came, you know, to Massachusetts, to Cape Cod, and they were here to establish the kingdom of God. And they were here, they were here to find out how they could lead the, the natives to Christ and then build up a community in an area of people that would be, have freedom, the freedom to worship the Lord. You too have been born, although we are in California, we are in the United States, and we feel this darkness like Esther felt it. We also will not bow. Mordecai would not bow. Esther never was forced to, but Mordecai said to her, if you choose not to rise up at this time to help save your people after the visceral hatred of Haman, then you are going to see your own family, you are going to be killed. Somehow they're going to find out and you are going to be taken out. People you love might live in absolute darkness and they might be letting anxiety control themselves. They, they, you have actually a great deal of power like Esther did. The power to pray and to declare. You know, Esther had no control over Haman. He had a lot of power. I don't have any control over what they keep shoving down my throat on the media and in the news and on our children in the schools. Um, well, you have some power. You can turn you off can, the TV. You can turn off the TV. And you can pull out the kid from the school. You can pull the kids out of school. That is very true. And that is something that each of you can do. But but to go in and actually go yeah, change and change the yeah. whole curriculum in the state of California and take all those images and books out of our libraries, I don't... I can't go from school to school and have any voice to say that unless I join one small school board. That's all. But Haman had the power to do that. And so you too have the power to pray and declare. Um, Haman had a lot of power and he was part of Esther's inner, her husband's inner circle. And the Bible doesn't specifically say, I already mentioned this, Haman might have been the one to help destroy the first marriage. Esther had to position herself, and I mentioned this beginning, position herself so that she was ready to um, be in perfect order to open heavens over herself and bring about the salvation of her people. In Isaiah 55, 6, it says, Seek the Lord 
while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. So do you cry out to the Lord on behalf of your nation like Esther did? Who are your people? Esther willingly fasted for three days and three nights and then walked into the king's presence, not knowing if he would welcome her or condemn her to death because you didn't just go into the king's presence. You had to have this golden um, his scepter sent out, put, pushed out and then you touch the, t the edge of the scepter and then you could walk in. Well, you had to be called into his court. And you had to be called into his court as well, yeah. And not only was she going to come in and talk to him, but she was going to confront Haman and fully expose his crimes to her husband and hope to find favor. You know, her husband trusted Haman. He was her trust. He was the trusted uh, prime minister, and the king would blindly follow whatever he wanted. I mean, she was up against a lot, and it was going to cost her everything to do what she needed to do. But how did she do it? She trusted in the word of the Lord. Esther at 4.16 says, Go, gather all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or nights. Um, day or night, my maids will, my, and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I must die, I must die. She was like, all right, I'm going to position myself exactly where I need to be. I don't know the right words, but I'm going to go do it. Today, the news can be so overwhelming in our in our in our cities, in our in our little newspapers, whatever city you're li living in, whatever news channel you watch, it can be overwhelming. And because the news is meant to bring inflammatory, it, it's meant to be inflammatory. It's meant to be very very aggressive to get your attention. The agenda for our children is very very overwhelming. It's utter depravity, destruction that is so wicked and dark. And what is our response? Many of us feel like we've been steamrolled and squashed. A lot of us are like, la, 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 I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. No, no, no. I'm not going to listen anymore. And we just curl up in a fetal possession, cover our ears, and we're like a broken toy. And that's what Satan wants. The devil wants to shut your voice like Haman wanted to shut Mordecai. And he didn't know about Esther, but he wanted to shut Mordecai down so badly. His anger was a visceral hatred against him. He looks to muffle your voice, to shove you into a dark corner where you will cower in fear and accept every human-like mandate as if it were law. But just like Esther, you have authority. In Christ, we have power and we have been called by the king to reign with him. And you were born for such a time as this. I used to think I'd never make it, you know, oh, everybody seemed, all the, my parents seemed to have lived this whole life, and where was I? I had never experienced anything. But Isaiah 55 gives me so much comfort, starting in verse 8, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. Oh, thank you, because my thoughts are full of anxiety, full of being overwhelmed, feel full of fear. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Thank you, Lord, because all I've got is my foolish small ways. I'm like, I don't know how to fix this one. I'm overwhelmed and there's just, you know, what do people do? And they're naturalized. They don't, they see the way that they think it should go. And they're like, no, it's never going to happen. But God says my ways are nothing and it are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And then it says, The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. Those are those seeds that you and I are going to plant. And they cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. What are we talking about? The word of the Lord. Praying, speaking, speaking and declaring. What did Esther do when she heard that death sentence for her people? She spent time in God's presence. She fasted. She prayed. She called on others to do the same. She said, all the people, go out and do the same. She positioned herself to be in tune with heaven. She spent three days and three nights fasting without eating or drinking. And on the third day, she went, went in and she faced the king. She was ready to face Haman and speak out 
and do whatever God called her to do. You know, the king was deeply in love with Esther. She did have his ear. She could influence for the good of her people. We too have King Jesus's ear. He loves us deeply and we can pray against these dark times and for the salvation of those you love for the nation you love. Esther could have stayed quiet, fearful, compliant to the horrendous fate of her people. And she did ask Mordecai if she could have that option. What if I just stay quiet? What if I just remain a good little queen, a good little wife and don't do anything? There comes a time in each one of our lives where we have an opportunity to speak out, declare, confront, correct. Will we be ready? Will be, will, are you positioned correctly to open up the heavens and speak out those, those words of life that you need to speak out to bring the salvation of, of the person who's next to you in line for your nation? We pray for our nation every single day, but I want to be properly positioned to go out and open the heavens everywhere we go. Uh, <clears throat> I was talking to my mother-in-law yesterday and she said, this was really neat. And this is something that is my prayer for each one of you. She said that this lady that um, we went to visit on the last day, I went and hugged her and said, you know, goodbye, thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm a hugger. Uh, people in Sweden don't hug that much, but this lady said that she felt this warm feeling inside of her when I hugged her. I said, that was the spirit of God. That was absolutely, and I actually want people to hug me and feel an electricity flow through them. So I'm like, more Lord, more, 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 position me more. I want the heavens to open over my life all the time and I want to rise up. I have been called for such a time of this. I will be that Esther. I will be that one who will be willing to speak the words into people's lives to see the darkness be destroyed because it's a personal thing as well. If you're covered in familiar spirits and you're blinded and you're deaf and there's a cement around you and you cannot seem to hear the spirit of the Lord, just like her husband, Esther's husband, the king, seemed to only listen to Haman. I break that cement over those people that I love. I want them to hear the voice of the Lord. I want to hear, I want them to hear the spirit of God. We need to humbly come into the sight of the Lord and release the power of God against the dark agenda. You know, you watch the news and you say, and then that depraved love, I say no. I release the power of God and I destroy the work of the enemy. I say those demonic spirits are gone in Jesus' name. And then the name of depraved science and the name of depraved violence against all of the thing that is good in this nation, I say no in Jesus' name. I release the power of God. I release healing. It says in the Bible that we are to bring healing. And that doesn't just mean physical, but it can. But also spiritual healing upon our nation. That we, those of us that are attending church, classical church, whatever church we're going to that is a Christian church, that we would rise up and confront the Hamans. Those voices, those, those governmental laws, the whatever, what, whatever they're trying to shove down our throats, we say, no, we will speak out those words, his truth, his word, and we will embrace and love those people that feel overwhelmed or fearful. We will go into those circumstances, whatever they are, and we will speak God's truth. You know, Haman thought he was invincible. He enjoyed his power. Satan, too, thinks that he's invincible. Haman didn't know the secret weapon. He didn't know Esther was an, a Jewish woman. He didn't know that she had been raised by, ha uh, by Mordecai. She, he did not know that she had um, great power. He just saw her as a woman. He's like, oh, she's just this young girl. Good. The king is happy for a while, entertained. He only saw her as something maybe for the, the king's sexual needs. He never saw her as anything more than that. A pretty face. That was it. He had plans to hang Mordecai from a gallows that he had built in his front yard. It was 10 feet tall. 10 feet. 10, 10 feet, yeah, it was <laughs> 10 cubits tall. Yeah, and the cubit yeah. is this big. Okay, so it wasn't tall, okay. But Mordecai yeah. knew that his God was greater and stronger and able to overcome the enemy. <clears throat> and in the end, Haman hung from the very gallows that he built for Mordecai and his whole generation was taken out. His ten, he had 10 sons. Do you think he didn't think he was powerful and amazing? He had 10 sons, kind of like some of these laws that have seemed to have 10 tentacles mm -hmm. and they never seem to 
be satisfied. They're always hungry for more and more. You will comply, you will comply, you will comply, and I'm going to keep you blinded, I'm going to keep you more and more deaf, and kick you down even further, and destroy your life even further, and I'm going to go after your generations, the young ones, the little children, I'm going to go out and destroy them as well. But Mordecai knew that his God was greater, stronger, and more able to overcome the enemy. And in the end, it was Haman and his ten sons that were destroyed. What can each of us do? Esther was willing. She's like, yes. And she went in and she talked to the king. She talked to the king and then she confronted Mordecai. And he like begs her for, um, for mercy. And at that moment, the king walks in and says, what, are you now going to violate my wife? That man had the, the, some sort of covering was put over his head, which meant instant death, instant death. And I think, I think Esther herself was able to say, you know, I think gallows or maybe one of his helpers was able to say, you know, a gallows was built for Mordecai in Haman's front yard. And the king's like, that's where he's going to die. Take him to it. I mean, Haman got to hear those words. And that is what I'm looking forward to. Those of us that are have been tormented and were exhausted, anxious, tired of seeing so much depravity, so much governmental mandate, so much over overpower, overpowering, overkill, all these words. I am sick to death of it, the overreach of our government. And I am willing to say I have been called for such a time as this. All right, I've got a voice. Even if you're only 17, even if you're only young, a child, I teach the kids in my Bible club to rise up and have a voice, to release the power of God and say, yes, I have authority and I will see your healing. I will see the end of these, these horrible laws. I will see our children protected, even in California where it seems like there's a trifecta of, you know, the assembly and the senators and the senators we send off to Congress, they seem to all be those 10 sons of Haman. The tentacles never seem to end of overreach on their part to destroy our lives and bring about the destruction of Christianity here in this state. But Jesus says, I am stronger, I am bigger, and you are my champion. Jen, go out there and speak words of life. And I believe, I, I say that my word will not come back empty and you will do it. And you will position yourself. And that's what I say to each one of you. Position yourself so that the portals of heaven are open over your lives and you are ready to go out and destroy what needs to be destroyed on behalf of your family and your state and your nation. In Jesus' name, those monstrous agendas will no longer stand. So rise up today, position yourself, spend time with him, intimate time, pray without ceasing, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, fill your mind and your heart with a passion for God's plans, God's heart over the people and the, the nation that you love. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray for you because I want to see great victory in Jesus' name in each one of your lives. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you are positioning each one of us to be those um, queens and kings that reign with you. We are chosen royal people. And all those Haman-like laws and Haman-like people that are being puppeted by the dark side, puppeted by Satan himself, we say in the name of Jesus that we will rise up and love on the people and we will cut the darkness. We will cut the tentacles of the enemy. We will say in the name of Jesus that our nation is one nation under God Almighty, the God of the Bible, the God that we love, who sent his only son to die on the cross for us. He rose again on the third day and he says, you are risen up with me. You are seated in heavenly places. You are with me and I love you, my dear child. Go out now and position yourself so that open heavens are over you and you can be part of that conquering people. You can be those champions. Yes, you were called to this time and this day. Go out there and do what you have been called to do in the name of Jesus. And so I pray for each person that they will be ready. They will be excited. They are victorious. They are champions. They are favored and precious to Jesus. And you do have a voice. It is so important that you use it and that you position yourself. And when I say position yourself, you need to spend time with the Lord. And so Lord, minister to each person so that they find that intimate time with you, Lord, where you can, where you can show them, you can show them exactly what you have for them to do. 
it might seem very small esther felt very small and felt very orphaned and 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 just she did i don't know that she saw herself as anything but you saw who you could use and you see each one of us and each one of us is a useful and and wanted precious positioned perfectly for god's plans so we rise up and we say yes and amen to god's plans in jesus powerful name amen amen and amen i'm going to pass the time over to pastor nick um, if you could please comment in the comment section that you can hear him. His voice is a little bit quieter, so we would ask you to say so so he can speak even louder. Uh, my daughter will give us a thumbs up to let us know. Um, but I want you to private message me and Pastor Nick if you would like us to pray with you, if you would like to have more um, training and understanding of all this that we've talked about this morning. We bless you and we pray that you will have uh, be a champion and be encouraged. Here's Pastor Nick. Thank you, Pastor John. <clears throat> uh, so a few days ago when I kind of... Uh, Does this work? No, no, it's a little too short. Okay, so okay, I'll try. Susie, let us know. Okay, so a few days when I was just uh, reading the Bible in the morning, uh, I started to read from Luke twelve thirty five, uh, and I think it's something that we have to be reminded of. So let's start from Luke uh, twelve thirty five, and then to forty. So be dressed with readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for the master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will guard himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait, wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third, he finds them so blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time, your, uh, what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Mm. So let's start with verse 35. So Jesus says here that we need to be dressed to be ready. In the ESV it says dressed for action. Amen. So are we always ready or do we kind of slack off like uh, nothing really happens. So I can just relax and yeah. just lay on the couch and it's just true. watch TV or whatever. Uh, My phone. Yes. Uh, so maybe we doesn't take our walk that serious. Mm. And the second part, it says that we should keep our lamps uh, burning. Mm -hmm. They should always be lit. What does that mean? So we need to have the fire ongoing and not cover it. We need to be a light in the world. Because Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill Amen. cannot be hidden. That's right. I, mean, I guess we, we see like, uh, I've been seeing like picture of like at least... Uh, Switzerland. Mm. So you cannot you cannot stand down in the valley, and then you have like a, a city like up in the mountain, and it, when it's so lit, beautiful. you can you can really see it up there. It's not it's not like it might be dark, but you see like there is light up there, so you can't cover it. Uh, nor do the light a lamp, uh, nor, nor do the light a lamp and put it under the basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. So when you have a lamp, then you don't just put it like under the bed or you don't put like it under like a basket so it doesn't lit. But you put it like in a lamp stand. I mean, today, uh, what would be today? Like you have like... You like a flashlight. Yeah, but like if, if you have the lights go out and it's pitch black, <clears throat> or even if you go camping, do you keep the flashlight... Turned off and in your backpack. Yeah, but also like if you had like light in your ceiling, I mean, do you turn them on or do you just have them off? Yeah, that's true. We I definitely mean, turn yeah. them on. Yep. So uh, uh, let your let's see, uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we are called to be the light in this world. 
when we walk in the light, there is no darkness in us. The world around us will see that there is something different with us. Like what is said in the end that that let the light so shine before men so that they see your good works. And because of they see your good works, they will glorify your Father in heaven. Because if they know that you are a believer, that you're a Christian, Amen. Then they, they will then you are an ambassador, you are representing Christ before them. Yeah. And if they can see that there's nothing they can blame on you, that you are hardworking, you are um, you have an integrity, you are trustworthy, then they know that there is something different. Uh, in John uh, first John one one to five to seven well first John one five to seven says this is the message which um, I have heard from him, which is Jesus, and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Mm-hmm. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice truth. So, I mean, let's see if, um, if you say that I'm a Christian, but then your life is like, you are lying, you are stealing, you are doing all the stuff. Now you are lying mm. because now you don't have fellowship with him. Because That's right. uh, if you have fellowship with him, you will obey his commandment. And his commandment definitely shows that you should not do all the stuff that you're doing there. I think one of the one of the hallmarks of a Christian as well is to be willing to humble themselves and ask for forgiveness and admit that they're wrong. You know, whether you're like, you know what, I really made a mistake and I hope that you will forgive me. And they might lay into you and confront you with all sorts of other things that you've done to them. So then you humble yourself and you say, you know what, Lord, you will lift me up in this one. I I really made a mistake. And I often pray, let anything I've made a mistake in saying or doing be for your good, Lord. And I do. I confess my sin. I do. We need to do that every single day. Hmm. Otherwise, people will see straight through us. Yep. Yep. (laughs) So seven, but if we walk in the light and he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin so when we are the light it will also affect the people around us like what i mentioned before that when we are trustworthy we are hard working we are uh, we have integrity people will see that and they will see there's a different then and they will be able to to trust even more, they know that you are trustworthy. So maybe they can put you in like a higher position too at the company because they know mm. that you are doing the work that you called That's to right. do. That's right. That's right. That's that a good point. And they can trust on you. Yes. And the image that kind of came into my mind is that, like when it comes to like that, that we are the light and it, and it will affect the people around us. Like, it's like, let's see, uh, it's like a dark room and hopefully it's not in, in the case in our like regular houses but so let's say you open the door to a dark room and as soon as the light comes in all the creatures on the floor kind of like goes into hiding i, I kind of mean like you see movies where you can you open like a door and you see all this Ew. cockroaches kind of like hiding under and that kind of stuff <laughs> I, I assume you can get the I hope image it's not my house yeah <sighs> so, so it because when we are the light it might expose some darkness in other people's life like what I mentioned before, that if we live with integrity, if we're hardworking, if we're all that stuff, you might also face opposition because other people at their work might try to cheat. They might not be war. And they might want to hide the crime and, and, now, and that you have to be part of it. So now, now because you're hardworking, so now you might give them, well, show them like in a bad light. Yeah. And can I expose that? Okay, this is what you expect from like a, uh, like a trustworthy worker. Mm. Uh, so like what I said it might expose the darkness in some people's life it doesn't mean that we have to kind of point out sin but when we walk in the light it will be a testimony to other people and reveal that they are walking in darkness Amen. so when we walk in the light when we walk in with that testimony that it will show that people that there is something different and that uh, and that when they also see the fruit of walking in that integrity that will also kind of trigger something in them that that I want to also have, do that. I, so so that our life is going to be a testimony. We don't always have to say a word, but our life sometimes in speaking more, 
I mean, sometimes we might say the word, but if our life is completely different, then our word means nothing. Mm, wow. So, so our That's life good. has to has to align with the word that we are speaking, so that we we're not like what it what we mentioned before that if we say that we are we have fellowship with him, but our life doesn't show that, then we are liar. So our life has to align with the word that we are speaking. And uh, so now let's go to continue back to uh, what we read from the beginning from Luke. Um, uh, what was it, Luke? Um, uh, 12 and then verse 36 there. Be like men who are waiting for the master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that he may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. So let's say you're expecting important guest. So do we continue and do nothing to like to prepare anything at all? Do we just like let it be messy, dirty, all the dust and that kind of stuff and like it's going to be a mess? Or do we start to clean up? We prepare food and other preparations. Maybe we have to have a guest room and that kind of stuff. So it's ready for them when the guests are coming. Do we have the same attitude when it comes to Christ's return? Do we keep ourselves ready, like what we read in, in, uh, in verse 35, that keep ourselves ready, dressed for action? Have the lamp burning? Are we preparing for his return? Amen. So, uh, like what I said, it kind of it goes back to the previous verse that we need to have our lamps lit. We have to have the uh, fire burning all the time. We need to be a light to the people around us, and we are ambassador for His kingdom. We need to be that uh, to kind of draw them to His kingdom, mm. because we want to see His kingdom be expanded. Amen. But should we only have this urgency to stay alert because we see more signs around us? Because I mean, especially if you kind of look at Facebook and uh, uh, well, this kind of reels on Facebook and uh, uh, Instagram or uh, YouTube and that kind of stuff. You see all this kind of talking about the science and all that stuff. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, it's almost like it's two, two camps in some way. So you have like, uh, uh, when they kind of, some people, when they see all this bad stuff uh, happening around us, they try to go in hiding, like what you mentioned, like, are we, are we kind of getting scared and we're just trying to get hide and, and we just wait for the rapture. Uh, and then we have the other camp who are standing on the promise of Jesus when he said to Peter in Matthew 16, 18 to 19, that I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I would build my church That's and right. the gates of Hades will not overpower it. That's right. So the Hades could be like, there's a darkness around us, but it will not overpower us. It will not overpower because we are in Christ. We are in walk in that power and uh, 19 says i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven Amen. and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loosen on earth shall have been loosened in heaven so here it doesn't sound like we we're meant to stand like powerless but we have authority to push back the power of darkness mm. the gates of right. Hades. we Amen. have the power to push it back to Woo! close it yes and unfortunately, many churches today, they don't teach this authority that we have through Christ's victory. It's the authority of the believer. And yes. It, and uh, if you go to Ephesians 1, 18 to 23, it, this is Paul when he, uh, when he's uh, in his letter to the Ephesians that it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened Amen. so that you will know that what, what is the hope of his calling, uh, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints so we have an inheritance in him and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believes so we are believe and we have this like abundance of power these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might i mean we know that his might i mean he created this whole universe so there is no like limit in his might which he brought about in christ 
when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right as his right hand in the heavenly places for above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come that's right so Amen. it wasn't just a time when when uh, paul wrote this letter but it was also for the future mm. Because we know that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's right. So he has the same power today as he had back when he was risen uh, from the dead. And he put all these things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over, over things to the church. Amen. So he is the head over the church. And in 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we are the fullness of him. So he is in us and we have the fullness of him. And, yes. and the fullness of him, and if we read all the stuff that he has, then we have access to all this power that is mentioned. So like what I say, even though this letter was written to believers in Ephesus, this message is still the same today. That's right. And Paul doesn't say that, and Paul doesn't pray that, he, that we would start to believe some made up things. But our eyes will open and to see the greatness we have in Christ. So this is something we have access to. It's nothing just a, like maybe or it might happen. No, we have, we have access to this thing in Christ. So Christ is far above all rules and authority and power dominion and every name for all futures. So he's above the people that is trying to be in charge and dictate what people can do and cannot do, like what you mentioned before. We, the church, is his body and the fullness of him fills us. So we can also walk in this victory and in authority. But the question, do we walk in this stature? Do we uh, have this attitude hmm. or do we have like the attitude of defeat? Uh, or cavalier uh, attitude where it's like, meh, it's the same. It's the same old thing every single day. And I mean, nothing happens. I got my own agenda. Yeah. I got things to do. Is that or, the way we act? Yeah, or are we meant, Are we just yes, standing strong? Are we standing on the promises that we read in Ephesians? Right. Here? Amen. When David met the Goliath, he didn't come with an attitude of, maybe I can beat him, but I'm not sure. We, let's just give it a try. No, he knew that God was so much bigger That's and stronger right. than Goliath. Amen. He already knew that he had a victory in his hand. And, and the same thing, it's the same thing when we read what, like in Ephesians said, that, that we see that Jesus is the one uh, that has the authority. And we have the power and authority to take over cities or nations. It doesn't mean that we should just do with violence, but God will put us in strategic positions. It's kind of like I thought about when you mentioned about Esther that uh, we might have to kind of go through some hardship in the sense like to kind of get where God wants us to be. I mean, we can't just sit and just wait for everything to be served to us. We have to also go out and do work. We have to do, we have to kind of be. I guess proactive is that what the name? Well, she was, she was stuck in a harem. Yeah, but but, but without she, anybody, any any other people around her that would know uh, anything about. But but what, what she did? She was, she was fasting and praying. She well, just before she had to go and see yeah. the king, she fasted and prayed for sure. And I'm pretty sure she was also constantly communicating with Mordecai. So she had a constant communication with the one that covered her, which is your pastor. And then she fasted and prayed. She was willing to go out and sacrifice herself yeah. when she was called to, to make those call to make that to make that push to do what she needed to do. I mean, it might be the same thing for us that maybe are we willing to sacrifice our comfort? To kind of go like to join like a school board meeting to go to kind of get into this position where we can be an influence in our society or do we just want to sit home and watch netflix or tv or something that's the thing that are we willing to to sacrifice to to uh, further his king and to just make the city to become more like a right to let like righteousness rise up in the in the important position or well and satan wants you to feel defeated you know well what can i do poor me i i don't have any strength or i'm stuck here and i'm stuck there you know in some sort of small menial thing and esther was like what can i do and her covering mordecai she listened to him and he was used by god to say 
This is your moment right now. Move forward. So who is speaking into your life? Who do you allow to speak into your life? Yeah. That's an important thing as well. So but we have let the enemy to take too many positions in our society, like important position. Uh, could be school boards. It could be like... District attorney, uh, judges, is, like judges, senators, like stuff. assemblymen. I mean, I mean, just this week, I mean, I was so frustrated about these different judges, how corrupt they are. And um, it's like... They're not um, blind. They, they they're don't not have blind. A, I mean, justice is supposed to be blind. They only they see Christianity not, and Christians as evil, yeah. and they, they look for every way, shape, and form to throw them in prison. And, but we need to rise up and take back our nation. From local city position to government positions in Washington D.C., we can't just shy away and wait for rapture to happen and uh, rapture to happen, since we don't know when, what time he comes back. Because, we carry the light, like yeah, you but, said, the light. Mm. Don't hide it under a bushel. We need to carry the light everywhere we go. Yeah, because I mean, only God knows that time, so nobody really knows what happens. Uh, and in verse 39, it says, "But be sure of this." That if the head of the house had known what hour of uh, hour that the thief was coming, he would ha not have allowed his house to be broken into. You to be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Amen. So we might think it's so dark and that kind of stuff, and we can expect, okay, of course the rapture could happen, but it sounds like we're supposed to rise up and yeah, be that voice. But I mean, it does because now it's probably like the time we probably expect about. It says like it would happen at a time when we don't expect. So it could be that the church rises up and it's going to be righteousness rising up. And maybe it's, it's going to look like it's going well. And maybe that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because then we don't expect it to happen. Because now it's right. like everything is going so well. So we don't know when he returns. But we have to keep ourselves ready and keep the light on. Amen. We need to continue to be the light in the world. Uh, because otherwise, how will people see the light and the truth That's if right. we're going into hiding? Amen. So we need to we need to go out and be the truth. We, yes. But we have to speak truth in love. Yeah. Uh, and but we have to be the truth, and we have to be um, an ambassador for His kingdom mm. uh, among the people in the world. That's right. So we have to keep ourselves active and work on uh, expanding His kingdom. Yes. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, we are thankful Lord, that you have, uh, like we've read in Ephesians, there is that that um, that we have the access. We have that through you, Christ, we have access to that power. And we just pray right now, Lord, that we we just walk in the authority that you've given us. That we have, we don't have a spirit of of defeat, but we are walking in victory because you, Christ. You won the ultimate Amen. victory that you kicked out. You That's kicked, right. You defeated Satan once Whatever. and for all, and that he had no access yes. anymore. He has no victory anymore because you won the ultimate victory, Hallelujah. and he's defeated once and for all. Amen. And it's just in our mind that we think he's big, but Lord, that but Lord, you are so much bigger, and yes. through your authority, we can defeat him. We can push him back. Yes, and like Lord. what it said in in um, when you said to Peter that that. Uh, the gates of Hades will not prevail. And that's what we declare right now, Lord, that we just walk in that authority that whatever happens around us, whatever darkness, whatever they try to push that's on right, us, that's right. that will, it will not prevail, but yes. it will push back because you have given us authority to that's lose right. and bind. Amen. And we just pray right now that we just walk in authority, that Lord, that you just continue to remind us that we are walking in your victory, that Amen. it's not our strength, but it's through your Holy Spirit that we have access to your power. Thank you, Jesus. And we just pray, Lord, that we just walk in a supernatural power wherever we go, Lord, whatever in the store, uh, in the schools, whatever, Lord, that, that we are walking with that supernatural yes. power. The people just be touched by your Amen. power. And Lord, show us where you want us to work in the school board meeting, senators, whatever, where you want us to be an influence. And Lord, that we are not uh, afraid to walk into this position, but we know that if you call us to do it, then we will walk there with with uh, with uh, confidence because right. you are with us. We generous. pray for this day. We just yes. pray for uh, Lord that wherever we walk, wherever we go, Lord, that we be just be a light. Yes, that we are yes. be a light in the dark world, Amen. and people will see the light, and that there we be drawn to that light, Lord. So we just pray right now for each one to just have strength. But we also pray for healing for each one out there who has who has sickness right now, and because you are also 
uh, you also took authority over sickness, and by the authority we just declare healing in each one Amen. of those bodies. Amen. Right? Hallelujah. Thank Jesus, you, right Jesus. Now. Lord, we just lift up and dedicate this day to you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you joined us this morning. We are part of Vida para las Naciones Internacional. Our senior pastors are Pastors Jack and Ismael Flores. We honor them and thank them for allowing us to be here on this platform. And uh, stay tuned because they will be preaching here at 11 a.m. Uh, we want you to have a wonderful week. We bless you. Uh, we just thank you. Thank the Lord for your life. And you are precious. You are favored. You are at home. If you choose to make this your home, we welcome you. Everybody is to be part of God's family. So welcome home to God's family if you've accepted Christ. He loves you. He wants you. You are chosen and precious. Have a wonderful week. Goodbye. <laughs>